Good afternoon. I'm Landis Jones, uh, the former executive director of the Grommar Award in World Order. And I'd like to welcome you uh, to the ceremony marking the eighth awarding of the Grommar Award for Ideas Improving World Order, the 1965 award. The purpose of the World Order Award is to stimulate the recognition, dissemination, and critical analysis of outstanding proposals for improving relations among nations. The awardees included outstanding academicians such as Richard Neustadt and Ernest May for their book, Thinking in Time, Robert Cohane for After Hegemony, Robert Jervis for, after, uh, for the Meaning of Nuclear Revolution, Herman Daly and John Cobb for the Common Good, Samuel Huntington for the Third Wave, and Donald Akinson for God's Peoples. The award has also gone to outstanding public figures whose ideas have had an impact perhaps more immediate than the slower acting, but ni still nonetheless uh, important academic ones. It was given to Gru Brundtland, the Prime Minister of Norway, who chaired the United Nations Commission on Environment and Development and reported its ideas in our common future. Mikhail Gorbachev, last president of the Soviet Union, for his speech given in 1988, extolling a new role for the United Nations and a new freedom in his own nation. And this year to the Foreign Minister of Australia, Senator Gareth Evans, for an article published in Foreign Affairs entitled Cooperative Security and Interstate Conflict. One of the most strict of the requirements for the Grommar Award is the willingness of the recipient to come to the University of Louisville to talk about her or his ideas for the benefit of this city and academic community. We are honored to have Senator Evans here today, as well as several of his colleagues who have come from the New York uh, and the most amazing congregation of the world's leaders in the Earth's history. Uh, Senator Evans' party includes uh, someone sitting up here on the stage, uh, John McCarthy, who is Deputy Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia, and uh, is uh, we are told uh, the going to be designated, will, is designated as the ambassador to the United Nations, so we're pleased at, to, to, to the U.S. Uh, uh, much more important is, is what the, uh, the foreign minister just told me, to the, to the United States. And uh, so we're very pleased to have him w with us as well. On uh, the platform or in the audience today are the members of the Department of Political Science Grommar Award Committee who did the initial work and screening on this year's uh, award. Uh, they're Paul Weber, who is the chairman of the department and uh, also serves on the final recommending committee. Dr. Roger Payne, who is the current executive director of the World Order Award. Dr. Charles Ziegler, uh, Dr. Alice Hashim, and uh, Dr. Andrew Scoble is probably parking the van that he brought out from the hotel. And um, the members of the University Award Committee, the, the final committee that recommends to the President and the Board of Trustees, uh, include uh, Dr. Thomas J. Hines, the Interim Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, who's right behind me, Lee B. Thomas, and Ethel White, and also uh, Dr. Donald Swain, our uh, past president who is in the audience. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, to you Dean Hines to present the 1966 winner of the Grandmeyer Medal and to introduce of the, of the 1965 winner of the Grandmeyer Medal and to introduce the winner and our speaker of the day to you, Dean Hines. Usually, we're only about 15 or 20 minutes behind the rest of the world and not 30 minutes, uh, 30 years behind the rest of the world. Um, but 65 and 95 were each wonderful years. <laughs> For 95, it is with great pleasure uh, that I present to you Senator Gareth Evans. Uh, Senator Evans has been Foreign Minister of Australia since September of 1988. He is also the leader of the government in the Senate. Uh, he has served successively as Attorney General, Minister of Resources and Energy, and Minister for Transportation and Communication. Born in 1944, Senator Evans has a law degree from Melbourne University and a degree in politics and economics from Oxford University. 
He has written or edited eight books, including Cooperating for Peace and Australia's Foreign Policy. As a diplomat, he is best known for his work in developing the UN Peace Plan for Cambodia, concluding the International Chemical Weapons Convention, and founding the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum. Senator Evans' idea, recognized specifically for this year's Grommeyer Award, uh, appeared in the 1994 article uh, previously cited by Dr. Jones, Cooperative Security and Interstate Conflict. His concept of cooperative security is central to his proposal for nations to move beyond the Cold War concept of collective security. Cooperative security, he writes, suggests consultation rather than confrontation, reassurance rather than deterrence, transparency rather than secrecy, prevention rather than correction, and dependence rather than unilateralism. He says that the United Nations must focus more sharply on international responsibility toward inter intrastate conflict and that intrastate intervention by the international community must be based upon clearly articulated threshold criteria agreed upon ahead of time by a consensus of nations. And to paraphrase the last paragraph uh, and of, uh, of this particular article, uh, and I think reminiscent of thoughts that many of us had as we read over the weekend and over the last week of the 50th anniversary uh, of the United Nations, uh, Senator Evans wrote, there could be no better time than now for a renewal of the commitment to achieve peace security, stability, and well-being among and within nations. And no better target date for making that all happen than the 50th anniversary of the coming into force of the United Nations Charter. Uh, Senator Evans, I, it's with great pleasure that I present to you this award. Dean Tim Hines, uh, Professor Landis Jones, distinguished guests, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. The only problem with this particular medal is that the, uh, the colours of the ribbon round it were our arch enemy football team uh, back in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> if it had been brown and gold, I would have been absolutely <laughs> ecstatic, but there it is. But today is the precisely the 50th anniversary day of the foundation of the United Nations, and I have to say, there could be no greater honour for me on this day to be presented with this Grawmeyer Award. And I'm very grateful indeed uh, to everyone associated uh, with the award, not least to the jurors sitting beside me for the taste and the judgment they so obviously demonstrated on this occasion. I'm very deeply conscious that this is one of the most prestigious awards of its kind in the world and that past winners have included statespersons like Guru Brundtland, and I now discover Mikhail Gorbachev. You're keeping him pretty quiet. And, uh, uh, he only just turned up to actually honour the award by, uh, by making the speech or the lecture a couple of weeks ago. There are also such universally known and respected scholars, as has been said, as Samuel Huntington, Robert Kahane, Richard Neustadt. I only hope that when measured against this exalted company, my own contribution won't come as a terrible anticlimax. But nonetheless, here goes. We didn't really foresee, when we ended the Cold War, that we would have to confront a hot peace. But such has been the case. Saddam Hussein showed us that the habits of millennia had not changed when he launched his massive cross-border assault against Kuwait for the crudest of economic and territorial expansion motives. <clears throat> and even though elsewhere conflict between states has been remarkably limited since the end of the Cold War, the phenomenon of conflict within states, driven by previously long suppressed ethnic and religious and political hatreds, has exploded almost exponentially. On the most recent available analysis that I've seen, every one of the 34 major armed conflicts waged around the world in 1993 was intrastate in character and that pattern does seem to be continuing. Are we fated in the international community 
to forever face the recurrence of deadly conflict with all its appalling costs in human life, human suffering and economic disadvantage? Or can we do, as it was hoped we could do, by the late Charlie Grumer, the founder of this award, and come up with ways of reducing that disorder, finding peace somehow amid the chaos? People in my profession are not normally optimists. Reality intrudes too immediately and too often to allow foreign ministers to nurture too many illusions for too long. But I genuinely believe that it is possible if we think clearly and consistently about the issues, and if we are prepared to get out of our armchairs and our studies to translate ideas into action, that we can, over time, change the way in which we respond to the prospect of conflict and can make the world a more secure and better place. In the particular publications for which I've been awarded this prize, uh, primarily the article in Foreign Policy entitled, as was said, Cooperative Security and Interstate Conflict, but also a book, Cooperating for Peace, which I launched at the UN General Assembly, in fact, a couple of years ago, in September 93. In those publications, I've been trying to do three things. First, to bring some conceptual clarity, to the extent that was still lacking, into the definition of security problems and possible responses to them. Secondly, to spell out some of the criteria which might guide decision makers, not least in the UN Security Council, in responding to security problems. And thirdly, I wanted to make some quite specific proposals for improving structures and processes, particularly in the UN system. Since that book and article were published, we do seem to have made a little progress in all the ways that I'd hoped, whether partly because of or despite my efforts, I leave to others to judge. But obviously we still have a long distance to go. Despite being much more conscious of the need to define mandates with precision and to match tasks with the resources necessary to accomplish them, we still find the UN in recent times being willing to send peacekeepers to Bosnia at a time when there was manifestly no peace to keep, and making commitments to peace enforcement in the protection of safe havens without providing the military resources on the ground to make that achievable. We still see the UN lacking the capability and apparent will to react rapidly to situations crying out for urgent intervention, as in Rwanda, where it's widely believed that the insertion at the right time of just around 5,000 troops properly armed and mandated to use necessary force could have prevented some 500,000 deaths. There's still resistance to the idea of the UN, or anyone else for that matter, having any responsibility at all to deal with situations within state borders if there's no obvious international dimension to the crisis in question. And I have to say there's still a resistance in the United States and elsewhere to anything which doesn't immediately seem to serve national interests as narrowly defined. Let me try to explain then in a little more detail the kind of rethinking that I've been trying to achieve. I'm under no illusions that the task will be an easy one. Major change always requires at least three stages. Achieving a degree of consensus among decision makers as to applicable principles, then articulating a clearly defined set of practical proposals for action based on those principles, and then hardest of all, securing enough commitment from governments, and key individuals, who have to, the people who have to make it all happen. But however long and difficult the task may be to make real progress on each of these levels, we do have to start somewhere. To begin at the beginning, it seems to me that there are four kinds of problems that are prima facie appropriate for the UN or other international security involvement. Emerging threats, disputes which are disagreements falling short of armed conflict, conflicts, which involve disagreements or disputes that have actually crossed the threshold into armed hostilities of one kind or another, and then what we might describe as a residual category of other major security crises, life-threatening crises of the kind that have been seen by the international community as justifying some security-related response. Just as these problems themselves range on a continuum from emerging threats at the more manageable end through more and more worrying disputes to conflicts, so too there's a graduated 
progression of appropriate responses which the international community should think about deploying when facing these different kinds of problems. And the four categories of response that I'll now talk about in turn are peace building, peace maintaining, peace restoring, and peace enforcement. Peace building is a concept which has hitherto been used, for example, by Secretary General Boutrous Ghali, only in a very limited kind of way to refer to rehabilitation and reconstruction after a major conflict has occurred. Cambodia is a clear example of such post-conflict peace building with resources put into, for example, mine clearance, economic development activity, government institution building. But I think, and I argue in the book and the article, that the concept of peace building can and should be employed in a much more broad-ranging way to describe a whole series of strategies, both within countries and internationally, which it is appropriate to deploy preventively to ensure that, in a whole number of different ways, disputes and conflicts don't even get started. In-country peace building means action involving both the international community and individual states themselves to achieve economic and social development, democratization, the elimination of gender and racial discrimination, respect for minorities, systematic improvement in the effectiveness of institutions of government. Peace building strategies thus described lie at the point where the peace and security agenda of the United Nations, the development agenda of the United Nations and the human rights agenda of the UN actually intercept and overlap. Policies which enhance economic development and distributive justice, which encourage the rule of law and protect fundamental human rights, including the fundamental right to participate through the ballot box in the making of the kind of government decisions which fundamentally affect people's lives, these are all in their own way security policies as well because they address many of the problems which lie at the heart of violent conflict. Peace is a necessary precondition for development and equitable development eradicates many of the socio-political conditions which threaten peace. It comes as no surprise to find that those economies, those countries rather, whose economies are declining, whose political institutions are failing, where human rights are abused, should also be the ones experiencing the greatest amount of violence and turmoil. The relationship between democracy and security is certainly a very direct one. It's a striking fact that there is no clearly recorded instance ever of established democracies going to war with each other. There's also a strong relationship, as you'd expect, between democracy and the question of violence within states. From the beginning of this century to 1987, according to one estimate, nearly 150 million people have been killed by their own governments, over and above the death toll from war and civil war, which account for an additional 39 million. Totalitarian states are responsible for 84% of those deaths, authoritarian states for most of the rest. Established democratic states, and I say established because there is some recent analysis suggesting that the period of transition to democracy can also be pretty risky, but established democratic states are not only less warlike than non-democratic states, they're also, as one might expect, as I said, less prone to violence against their own citizens. At the international level, the idea of peace building centers on creating or strengthening international structures or regimes aimed again at minimizing threats to security, building trust and confidence, operating as forums for dialogue and cooperation. Examples of what I mean across that kind of spectrum here are treaties governing traditional, traditionally volatile issues like the law of the sea, dispute resolution forums like the International Court of Justice in The Hague, multilateral security uh, dialogue and cooperation forums like the, uh, the OSCE, Organization on Security and Cooperation in Europe, established under the Helsinki process, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the newly established ARF, as it's called, in the Asia-Pacific area. And above all, I mean here multilateral arms control and disarmament regimes. And I have to say there's no better preventive contribution that the international community could be making to peace and security in this area than achieving once and for all the elimination from the face of the globe 
of all weapons of mass destruction. We've taken a big step forward in this respect with the negotiation of the Chemical Weapons Convention, which if Jesse Helms ever lets out of his committee might actually be ratified by the United States. We've taken partial steps which need to be strengthened with the Biological Weapons Convention. But the biggest challenge of all, of course, is nuclear weapons. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, even when it's supported by the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which we all hope will be negotiated to conclusion next year, even when it's supported by the START Arms Reduction Treaties between the US and the former Soviet Union, again on the assumption that Senator Helms uh, lets those treaties uh, proceed, they won't get us to a nuclear-free world unless and until the existing declared nuclear weapon states start to get absolutely serious about elimination, not just in the never-never, but in accordance with a clearly defined time frame. Might I add to my printed text and say that as a contribution to that particular cause of the elimination of nuclear weapons, I'll be travelling to The Hague, to the International Court of Justice next Monday, to argue the case on behalf of Australia in international law for achieving that elimination. The context is the advisory opinions case uh, just commenced before that court uh, by the United Nations General Assembly and the World Health Organization seeking an opinion from the court as to the legality of the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons. Australia will be the country leading uh, the substantive argument, leading off the substantive argument anyway, uh, on those issues. And that's what I'll be doing next Monday. Well, so much for peace building. What about maintaining peace? Whereas peace building is about preventive strategies designed to address the underlying causes of security, peace maintenance is about strategies designed to address actual disputes which may, if not resolved or contained, deteriorate into armed conflict. The basic focus here is on what we call preventive diplomacy, though there is another form of peace maintenance gaining increasing currency, uh, also under this sort of peace maintenance heading, and that's preventive deployment, which is the sort of thing that's been done in the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia with American troops going in there as a deterrent presence against the possibility of a spillover of the conflict elsewhere in the Balkans. But concentrating on preventive diplomacy, as I will, this embraces a variety of ways of resolving or at least containing disputes by relying on diplomatic or similar methods rather than military ones. And the methods here are the classic peaceful means described in Article 33 of the UN Charter. Negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, and sometimes judicial settlement. The ongoing efforts by various different actors in various ways to stop conflict erupting in Burundi, in the Korean Peninsula, in the South China Sea are some current examples of preventive diplomacy at work. But preventive diplomacy is basically a more low-profile business, lacking the obvious media impact of blue helmet peacekeeping, let alone full-scale war-waging peace enforcement. The point about preventive diplomacy is that it succeeds when things don't happen. And therein lies the political problem with this and indeed any other preventive activity. If it works, nobody notices. And I have to say it's an iron law of government, national or international, that everyone likes to be seen to be doing something. And the notion that something might be inherently worth doing or worth doing as an insurance premium to avoid a larger payout later tends to be foreign to the political psyche. I think we're just going to have to put more effort into getting more people to see the point of that really rather splendid observation that's been attributed to Jean-Marie Lane, who won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1986, when he said this, only those who can see the invisible can do the impossible. Preventive diplomacy, when it's applied early, is when it's likely to be most successful, well before armed conflict is likely. But it's unfortunately been the case too often in the UN system that preventive diplomacy efforts have been attempted too late when escalation is so advanced that the slide into hostilities is almost inevitable. Despite the importance and the cost-effectiveness of preventive diplomacy, 
The UN devotes relatively few resources to it. There are presently only some 50 officials in the entire system that I can identify who are assigned to tasks that I would regard as immediately relevant to such diplomacy. Compare that with around 60,000 UN peacekeepers, military peacekeepers, at the moment in the field, and of course compare it with approximately 30 million armed service personnel worldwide. The UN must, I think, upgrade its capacity to the point where it can offer an effective dispute resolution service to its members, providing low-profile, skilled, third-party assistance through good offices, mediation and the like. I've argued elsewhere that this could be done very effectively for a cost of around about $20 million a year. By comparison, the UN's peacekeeping budget for last year was $3.2 billion, while the cost to the UN coalition of waging the Gulf War has been estimated at $70 billion. What can the international community do short of taking enforcement action of its own when it actually faces a conflict situation? And here we come to peace restoring strategies. And there's two basic such strategies available. One is peacemaking, the other is peacekeeping. Peacemaking is essentially diplomatic and related activity, exactly the same sort of thing you do when you engage in preventive diplomacy, but in this context after a conflict has broken out. One kind of peacemaking is encouraging parties to embrace a ceasefire after they've been shooting each other. More complex peacemaking activity is when you're trying to get the parties not merely to stop shooting, but to reach agreement about a whole strategy for transition back to peaceful, secure, stable government. Cambodia is a very good example of a peacemaking exercise, one in which I personally was very closely involved, that went on, in fact, over a number of years, culminating in the 1991 Paris Peace Conference, when a whole group of countries, as well as the internal players, got together and agreed upon a very complex peace blueprint. Sometimes you hear the expression peacemaking used as a synonym for actual military enforcement activity, on the same principle, I suppose, as in the old Western movies, where Colt 45s, this audience will know better than me, used to be called peacemakers. But I have to say, I regard that as a most unhappy analogy from a whole variety of terminological points of view, and I think it ought to be avoided. The other side of the peace-restoring coin is peacekeeping. When you have your blueprint in place, when you have your agreement, whether it's about something relatively straightforward like a ceasefire, or whether it's about something much more complex like a whole transition back to normality strategy, you need someone to monitor, to supervise, to oversee that process, to conduct elections perhaps, to operate the rudiments of a transitional government process, to fill the vacuums that might otherwise exist. All that is peacekeeping activity. It might take a very simple and traditional form, as in Cyprus, where you have just a thin blue line uh, separating for many years now the Turkish Cypriots from the Greek Cypriots, but nothing much else happening. Or it may involve an extremely complicated, expanded peacekeeping operation of the kind that we had in Namibia and again in Cambodia. Looking at the difficulties experienced, for example, in Somalia and Bosnia and Rwanda, it's easy to be pessimistic about the prospects for peacekeeping, and these days many people are. But for everything that's gone wrong over the last few years, there is something else that's gone right, such as the UN operations in Namibia and Cambodia, and in El Salvador, and in Mozambique, for example. We must remember to balance the setbacks with the successes, and to maintain realistic expectations of what it's possible for the international community to achieve. The most crucial consideration in embarking on any peace operation, whether it be peacekeeping of the kind I've just described, or whether it be peace enforcement of the kind that I'll come to shortly, the most crucial consideration is that there be a clear-minded focus on the objectives of the exercise and the likely effectiveness of the operation in achieving those objectives. No operation of this kind should ever be embarked upon for the sake of being seen to be doing something. Although it's not always possible to analyse or to predict with certainty, it should always be possible to avoid embarking on operations which are manifestly likely to be ineffective, which as such put at risk the most crucial UN resource of all, its credibility. In the specific case of peacekeeping, I've suggested that there are seven basic conditions for ensuring an effective operation. Clear and achievable goals, 
adequate resources, close coordination of peacekeeping with any ongoing peacemaking activity. You often need to just hold the line to supervise a su ceasefire or something while you're negotiating a more complex uh, permanent strategy. There's a capacity to be and to be seen to be absolutely impartial as between the parties have been in conflict. That capacity is another crucial requirement. There should be a significant degree of local support for the peacekeepers. There should be evidence support for the operation from external powers who may have been involved previously in supporting one side or the other. And there should be a signposted exit. That's to say, a clearly designated termination point or set of termination criteria. Well, situations do, of course, arise where peace can't be restored by diplomatic, by peacekeeping means. And the international community is consequently obliged to consider more drastic enforcement measures. Non-military enforcement in the form of sanctions designed to compel or bring to an end a course of action has been applied on a number of occasions by the UN, the best known cases being the web of sanctions against the apartheid regime in South Africa and those applied against Iraq in the context of its assault on Kuwait and against the former Yugoslav Republic in the context of the war in the Balkans. The aim of sanctions is to deny the government or the party involved continued access to goods or services which it needs to maintain its economic, social or political infrastructure or well-being. Typically this has involved actions such as the cessation of military supplies, the complete or partial interruption of economic relations, the severing of communications links such as postal, telephone, radio, rail, sea, land links, the severance of diplomatic links. Action to freeze reserves or disrupt financial transactions may also be applied. Such actions are designed to achieve their objective by depriving the state concerned of the military and the economic means to maintain the offending behaviour, by precipitating domestic pressure on its government or by bringing moral pressure to bear upon it internationally. The trouble is with all of that that sanctions take an awfully long time to bite as we've seen all too clearly in the case of both Belgrade and Baghdad. So there may be conflicts or major crises when, in the absence of agreement by the parties concerned and with sanctions manifestly unlikely to succeed, at least within any kind of reasonable time frame, the international community is faced with its last resort option, to intervene to enforce peace with the threat or the use of military force. Such peace enforcement may be required in response to aggression over across international borders, such as, for example, the Korean War and the 1991 Gulf War. It could arise in support of peacekeeping operations, for example, in situations where one or more parties to an agreement have subsequently withdrawn and there's a need to enforce a ceasefire. Or, as, for example, in the case of Bosnia, to protect safe havens, to try to protect safe havens and enforce no-fly zones. Or, again, uh, the context in which peace enforcement issues arise is in the very difficult area of supporting humanitarian operations in a violent environment, such as the operations in Somalia. Although the distinction between peacekeeping and peace enforcement has become rather blurred at the margins in recent years, I believe it's crucially important to mark an absolutely clear line of separation between the two. In UN charter terms, with which some of you I guess will be familiar, that means drawing a clear line between military operations where the mandate is derived from Chapter 6, which deals with the Pacific settlement of disputes, and those military operations whose mandate is based on Chapter 7, certain provisions of which expressly authorise the use of force. Real problems can arise, and we've seen this especially in Bosnia and Somalia, when Chapter 6 peacekeeping operations, which are premised, as I've indicated, upon the consent of the parties to the UN's presence and should be inherently peaceful, problems really do arise when those sorts of operations get mixed up with Chapter 7 peace enforcement missions, which are based on a presumption of resistance by one or more of the parties and which are mandated to apply whatever force is needed to meet the operation's objectives. As the Australian military commander of the Cambodian peacekeeping mission, Lieutenant General Sanderson has put it, peacekeepers, as distinct from peace enforcers, are instruments of diplomacy, not of war. UN Secretary General Boutrous Ghali commented in the January this year supplement to his report and Agenda for Peace, uh, 
But the experiences of the last few years have confirmed the importance of some basic principles of peacekeeping as they originally evolved under Doug Hummerschild. Consent of the parties, impartiality of the peacekeepers, and the non-use of force except in self-defence. Use of force other than in self-defence runs the risk of forfeiting the consent of the parties, such consenters are still there, and compromising the neutrality of the peacekeepers. Of course situations can arise where operations which start out with the consent of all parties lose it along the way through no fault of the peacekeepers. That actually happened, you may remember, in Cambodia with the Khmer Rouge who had originally agreed to demobilise their troops and to participate along with all the other factions to the conflict in the planned election, reneged on that promise and did so after the UNTAC peacekeeping mission had arrived. A really critical problem would have arisen had they taken the next step and resorted to violence to try to disrupt the UN supervised election. Could and should the peacekeepers, who were neither equipped nor trained to act otherwise than in self-defence, have responded in kind, with violence, with force, to defend the mission's mandate? Mercifully, everyone's nerve held. The Khmer Rouge's bluff was called. The situation never reached that decision point. But I have to say, and again I was right in the middle of all this, it's very doubtful that the Cambodian peacekeepers could have become peace enforcers with the basis of their mandate changed from chapter 6 to chapter 7 without there being a significant period of transition in which forces could be retrained or substituted. And in that interim period, who knows what would have happened. The whole thing may well have collapsed. The question of just when the international community should become involved in peace enforcement operations is a very difficult one. Questions of cons consistency, not constituency, questions of consist consistency will inevitably arise, but resource constraints will always in practice demand some selectivity. But the impossibility of intervening everywhere should not bar the UN from acting anywhere. The international community must accept the inevitability of what might be called opportunistic idealism. What's most crucial is that decisions only be made after the most careful consideration of a whole range of criteria, and again not rushed into simply because of that recurring political urge to be seen to be doing something. Sometimes, painful as it may be, it is better to do nothing at all than to embark upon a mission with a high probability of failure. When it comes to peace enforcement operations, the criteria that I and others have suggested for determining involvement are really quite complex and vary according to whether the operation is one in response to cross-border aggression, as with Iraq and Kuwait, or whether it's in support of peacekeeping operations, the basic rationale, as I've said, for the involvement in Bosnia and Herzegovina, or whether it's in support of humanitarian objectives, as in Somalia. But the basic considerations come down to these. Widespread international support, clear and achievable goals, adequate total resources to meet those goals, and clearly defined termination or review points. I do want to say a bit more, though, about one particular area here. The most difficult single area in which to make a judgment as to whether a forcible intervention should be contemplated is unquestionably the humanitarian one, where, as was the case in Somalia, there's a conflict occurring within a state and people are suffering on a conscience-shocking scale. Even before one gets to the question as to whether military resources are going to be actually available, there are a whole tangle of conceptual and practical difficulties which you meet right at the threshold in confronting these situations. I've suggested that the checklist that decision makers should work through should include at least all of these elements. That there's a consensus that the right to life, the most basic human right, is under threat that there's no prospect of alleviation of the situation by the government, if there is one, of the state in question, that all non-military operations or options have been considered, tried where appropriate, and have failed, that there's a report from an impartial and neutral source, such as the Red Cross, that the humanitarian crisis can no longer be satisfactorily managed, that there's been consultation reflecting not only a wide spectrum of advice from outsiders, but so far as possible the views of the external and internal parties involved. That there's a high degree of consensus on the issue between developed and developing countries, 
and that hard-headed assessments have been made about the international community's capacity to follow through from addressing the immediate crisis to helping the affected state retain its viability as a functioning sovereign state able to take care of its own citizens. But even before one gets to these questions, there is, at least when it's United Nations action that's being contemplated, an even more basic conceptual question that has to be addressed. And that is whether it's ever right to intervene without the agreement of all concerned in an intra-state conflict. In the past, enforcing peace, whether by sanctions or by the use of military force, tended to present few conceptual problems, particularly when it was applied to fairly clear-cut cases of cross-border aggression. For intrastate conflict, however, the conceptual basis for such actions, in particular military force, is considerably more problematic. On a traditional view, the UN's security role is limited to protecting the physical and political integrity of states. As the pressures grew following the end of the Cold War for recognition of a right of humanitarian intervention in response to various crises, developing countries began to express concerns that this might presage a new era of imperialism with an American-led Security Council using humanitarian crises as a vehicle for forcing its will on states which it disliked. In practice, however, and in the light of actual peace operations experience in recent times, these concerns do seem to have abated. Less attention is being these days paid to formal jurisdictional limits on intervention, limits that may be expressed or implied in the <coughs> UN Charter. More attention is being paid to the question of the effectiveness of the operation and whether or not there's the political will to undertake it, given domestic hostility or indifference. The main difficulties which arise now tend to be with defining what are appropriate cases for intervention and with delivering effective responses. But all that said, I do still think that there's a case for taking a fresh look at possible doctrinal or conceptual foundations within the UN Charter itself for a more wide-ranging security role for UN organs than the role that the traditional state-centred doctrine would allow. It's not merely a matter here of having theory catch up with practice. The more compelling reason is that the international will to intervene decisively and helpfully in intrastate conflicts, even when on the nightmarish scale of Rwanda, that will has been flagging, and I do think it needs some re-injected momentum. There's two approaches that seem to me particularly worthy of further exploration here. I've explored them both in detail in the foreign policy article, uh, and I'll leave it there to I won't burden you uh, as a result with the, the detail of it here, but just me, let me say in a sentence or two. Um, the first approach is to develop the notion that security, as it appears in the Charter, is as much about the protection of individuals as it is about the defence of the territorial integrity of states. Human security, thus understood, is at least as much prejudiced by major intrastate conflict as it is by interstate, a cross-border conflict. The second approach, which I think is potentially fruitful and needs to be further explored, which could either stand alone or be seen as reinforcing the human security approach, this second approach would pursue to its logical limits the international community's uh, basic human rights principles, bearing in mind that the most basic human right of all, that of life, to life is violated on a very large scale in intrastate conflicts. Well, that's all the various doctrinal and um, practical issues which arise at the threshold. But we still haven't got, I'm afraid, to the end of the story because intervention also involves the question of capacity. Being a suitable case for treatment will never be sufficient ground in itself, given resource constraints, to guarantee that treatment. Who's going to supply the troops? As the initial response to the Rwanda crisis demonstrated, or the initial non-response, it's becoming difficult even with CNN playing its part in bringing the crisis to world public attention, it's becoming very difficult to get the UN's member states to intervene forcibly anywhere. The underlying reality is that if vital national interests, narrowly defined, are not immediately and directly threatened, it's become extremely difficult for democratic states to sustain domestic support for distant and risky military operations overseas, even when their governments may wish to do so. Public education programs about the importance of international peace efforts may help, but probably not much. In other cases, 
Bosnia, and until very recently has been a clear example, governments have not even shown much inclination to put public opinion to the test, adhering, as someone recently rather unkindly put it, to the perverse doctrine that a great military machine must be reserved for the kind of war fighting where there are no casualties. Ideas for meeting the problem of resistance to involvement in dangerous UN operations by creating the United Nations' own military force have been around for some time and there's been quite a flurry of recent activity from the Dutch, the Danes and others suggesting variations on a volunteer standing force theme. I have to confess that my own views have moved backwards and forwards on this uh, question. I have to confess that because all the inconsistencies are on the public record. But after devoting many hours of discussion to this complex issue around Europe and in New York and Washington in recent months, and trying to make a practical judgment as to what's actually achievable in the short to medium term, I now firmly believe that our priority efforts should be devoted to building the UN's headquarters capacity to enable it to better conceptualise operations, to construct their mandates, to plan them, to organise them, to rapidly set them in train. I think the way forward in this respect has been shown by an excellent Canadian study towards the UN rapid reaction capability, which has just been presented a few days ago to the General Assembly. The point being that if there can be a really major enhancement of the UN's strategic and operational planning capacity, in a way that generates a confidence in that capability now largely lacking, then member states are likely to be much more willing to earmark forces, much more willing to deliver up military units for rapid reaction purposes. The idea of a standing volunteer UN force is certainly one that should continue to be quietly explored, but it's not an idea whose time has yet come. Well, finally, there are three particular themes or emphases that have emerged from all my experience of and thinking and writing about international peace and security problems that I'd like to leave you with. The first is that, as with so much else in life, preventive strategies, preventive strategies, if you can possibly make them work, are infinitely more cost-effective and attractive than responses after the event. Preventing disputes from becoming conflicts, becoming threats from becoming crises, just makes so much more sense than having to try to mobilise the will and the resources to deal with conflicts and crises in full flight. The second theme I leave you with is the need for a particular preventive strategy, peace building, to have a much higher priority in peace and security policy. Linking, as it does so directly, to the UN's and to the whole international community's economic and social and human rights agendas, Peace building, in the way in which I've tried to define it, has the capacity, I think, to become the conceptual rallying point for a massive new effort to address the underlying causes of world disorder. My very last theme is the virtue of using the idea of cooperative security as the central sustaining idea in the future for our efforts in the international community to secure and maintain peace. The idea of cooperative security, without going into it now in very much detail, embraces, in a way that very much emphasises prevention rather than cure, in fact three separate ideas, collective security, common security and comprehensive security, which have been evident in thinking about international security problems for some time. The first, collective security, you'll be most familiar with, that's got a long tradition in the UN and elsewhere, it involves the notion of a group of member states agreeing to renounce the use of force among themselves and to collectively come to the aid of any member attacked by an outside state, or for that matter attacked by a renegade internal member. The power here to prevent conflict is based on the idea of deterrence against aggression. It's collective security. Then in the 1980s, recognition of the need to act at an earlier stage to prevent conflicts actually occurring gave currency to the idea of common security. And the essence of that idea is states best find their security by working with rather than against others. Then attention came to be given to the idea of comprehensive security with quite widespread acceptance of the notion that economic and social cooperation needed to be combined with purely military security in a multifaceted, multidimensional approach. 
Well, the idea of cooperative security, very simply, brings all those approaches together. Brings those three approaches together in a way which I think is readily communicable and easily understood. Cooperative security is an approach to security which is multidimensional in scope. It's gradualist in temperament. It emphasizes reassurance rather than deterrence. It's inclusive rather than exclusive. It favors multilateralism over bilateralism. It doesn't privilege military solutions over non-military ones. It assumes that states are still the principal actors in the security system, but accepts that non-state actors may also have an important role to play. It doesn't require the creation of formal security institutions, but it doesn't reject them either. And above all, cooperative security is an approach which stresses the value of creating habits of dialogue on a multilateral basis. Well, the world we live in at the moment is very far from ideal, and very far from being governed by these kinds of principles. But I continue to nurture the hope that if men and women of goodwill around the globe continue to aspire for a better world, and are willing to work together cooperatively by every available means, especially through the organs and agencies of the, of the United Nations, the only sufficiently empowered global organization we have or are ever likely to have, then that better world, one in which the needs of every individual for peace and security, a decent standard of living, and personal dignity and liberty are better met than they are today, then that better world is within our reach. Thank you. We, we are going to have time for questions, and uh, I would like to have you uh, pose those questions uh, to Senator Evans. Should the United States be withholding payments from the United Nations, and what do you think of NATO? <laughs> no, the U.S. should not be withholding contributions from the U.N. We, lots of other member states, have made that perfectly clear. There are two problems at the moment. One is just the basic budgetary assessments, which are running behind, as they often have in the past, but which are more than ever stuck in the Congress as a result in of the present dynamics in the Congress, which you'd be well aware of. I think the administration is doing its level best uh, to extract those resources from the Congress, but in the context of the present uh, budget-cutting enthusiasms, that's going to prove very difficult, and there's a real anxiety in the international community that this is not just a transient problem, but uh, really a rather permanent one, which has led me and others to suggest that the time may have come to start looking at some uh, extra member state sources of finance, like putting a levy on international air tickets, maybe $10 per international sector, which would generate $3 billion, nearly as much as uh, is paid on peacekeeping at the moment. That's another story. The second problem with the US at the moment is something that is an administration initiative and which was done unilaterally uh, by the US without negotiation. That was reducing the proportion of the peacekeeping <coughs> budget paid by the US from 31% to 25%. Now, I have to say that 31% was manifestly a very big burden for the US to be bearing, particularly in the explosive expansion of peacekeeping expenditure, which we've seen since the end of the Cold War, from just a handful of peacekeeping missions to 16 or 17 operating, just a handful of personnel to 70, 80,000 uh, people. Uh, but all that said, it would have been clearly preferable for the US to have worked harder, I think, at negotiating that back again, I think, to a largely Congress, Congress uh, driven reasons for that, uh, but there it is. And it is difficult, I, I'm afraid, uh, for the US to, to talk as it does about reform of the UN system, um, saying some extremely intelligent and useful and worthwhile things about reform. Uh, at the same time, there's not actually meeting uh, its existing budgetary subvention uh, requirements because it tends to reduce the credibility of the reform argument. Um, in circumstances where God knows that credibility is, is necessary. I mean, I'm a great supporter of the UN, uh, 
defended against all sorts of assaults and attacks, but I'm the first to concede that there's an awful lot that should be done from within. And the notion of using the sort of the budgetary weapon as some sort of leverage to get reform is, I think, one that's almost certain to be counterproductive in the UN context. It just does generate a resistance rather than cooperation. <laughs> as to what I think about NATO, well, I mean, NATO is uh, alive and well and performing well, uh, one has to say, in the context of the resolution of the Balkans uh, conflict in circumstances where the UN machinery simply wasn't being given. Uh, the proper resources to do the job that I think it could have been done under UN auspices had the member states been willing to, uh, to go that extra distance. The problem about the UN's involvement in Bosnia was that it, and the Balkans generally, is that it fell between two stools, which I described. On the one hand, they set in train a peacekeeping mission when there manifestly wasn't a peace to keep, where there wasn't the necessary agreement level among the parties to have that kind of peaceful operation and then tried, when the chips were down, to supplement that with a peace enforcement strategy with the safe havens and so on, but not matching that with the kind of resources, both in terms of ground troops and air uh, personnel and so on, uh, that would enable that to stick. You can't blame the UN organisation, as people tend to do, uh, for that. You have to blame the member states, the key players on the Security Council, who just weren't prepared to put the resources uh, where the necessity, where the logical necessity was. NATO, um, suffering many fewer uh, restrictions than the UN in this respect, a much smaller decision-making um, circle, um, was able eventually, after obviously some years of agony about it before they did grasp the nettle, uh, to do the job and have done it in a way which mercifully seems to have precipitated at last the necessary will to, uh, to negotiate. Whether that just coincided with the exhaustion of all the parties or whether it precipitated the exhaustion, I suppose historians will argue about, but there it is. I mean, there are many larger questions about NATO, which I presume you don't want me to get into, about uh, you know, partnerships for peace and whether Russia and so on ought to, so on ought to be embraced. Um, but basically, I've, I've got no hang-ups or inhibitions about, uh, about NATO and the role it's been playing. And it, in the particular context that's most visible at the moment, I think it's been a very positive and useful role. Yeah. Well, I don't regard distributive justice, economic justice, as being incompatible uh, with basic capitalist uh, management of the economy. What you've got to do is accompany uh, the unbridled uh, capitalism of the marketplace with appropriate uh, regulatory regimes and so on around the edges, appropriate tax regimes, appropriate social security regimes, uh, to actually ensure uh, that the, the benefits of the wealth that are thus generated are uh, evenly distributed. Um, criminal regimes against corruption and so on are also an important part of the repertoire. Uh, the problem is that um, some of the unbridled capitalism, as you described, that we've seen at work in, in some of the uh, developing countries has not been accompanied by those safety nets or safeguard measures of one kind or another. And as such, you're seeing the phenomenon at its, its, at its crudest and worst. I mean, a bit like the latter 19th century America, but um, you fix that up over time. And nobody, I think, has too many hang-ups in retrospect about the way in which that sort of economic energy uh, has, in fact, been given to the uh, to the American economy. I mean, part of the uh, the learning curve for all of us in this business, um, particularly in the left of politics, and I'm in the Labor Party in Australia, which is a democratic socialist party with a long tradition of that kind, long tradition of commitment to public ownership and belief that uh, things could only be really done in a sensitive way by governments, that you couldn't leave it to the marketplace. Um, in recent years, last decade or two, I think um, it's not that we've all just got older, I think we have come to the realisation uh, that you know, that ain't so, that that's the only way that distributive justice and so on can be assured. And that really if you rely on uh, government institutions, and formal processes of that kind, to be your basic economic engines, you're going to be left uh, lamenting on uh, the scale that the, uh, the good citizens of the Soviet Union are about the, the manifest inadequacy of those sort of techniques to, uh, to deliver results.
So, um, you know, we, we are in the encouraging of free trade, free market uh, business, uh, those of us who argue for peace building. They're not incompatible propositions. We're in the business of feeding in development uh, assistance from the richer to the poorer countries. We are in the business of utilising the World Bank and the other international agencies to effectively and in a focused way deliver that. Um, we are certainly in the, uh, the business of trying to strengthen government institutions uh, within those countries so you've got effective frameworks to deliver the kind of regulatory safeguards that I'm talking about. Uh, but all of that really is compatible with basically uh, uh, letting, letting the basic economic momentum uh, come from the, the natural forces that are work. I mean all experience everywhere um, is that it's, it's only when that really gets going and in the context of a wider free trade environment internationally it's only in that context that you really start getting the GDP uh, increases, the real growth, that at the end of the day is far and away uh, the best source of uh, greater prosperity for people in developing countries. You don't